Well, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs tonight and uh, just dive into our study. We are uncovering some secrets that the wisest man in the world uh, had about the issues of life, and I'm super excited about this lesson tonight because we're going to dive into some secrets about financial success given by the wealthiest man that has ever lived. How many would like some financial success? Let me hear you shout amen. 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 I believe you're going to get that tonight. I know that. I really do. Not just by what we're going to talk about, but I believe the presence of God is in this room. And I believe, that, amen, it is. The Lord is here. And I believe the Lord wants you to really open your eyes and heart to what his word has to say just about the area of money and about the area of finances. Now, so we're going to uncover some very practical truths out of the book of Proverbs about money, because if you're going to look for a financial advice what better person to look to than the man that probably made more money than anybody in the history of the world? And that is Solomon. And as I've said before, after his prodigious wisdom, the Bible describes his nearly unbelievable wealth in detail. So I'm going to set the table only to let you know that the principles, they come from the Holy Spirit, the heart of God, but they are spoken by a man who lived out these principles. And I believe that when we live out the principles of the Word of God, how many believe God's Word always works? Somebody shout amen. Always, every time. So I want you to go in, in your Bible now. This is not a proverb, but it does describe Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter number 9. And there's several verses here that describe Solomon's wealth in detail. And I want you to see it before we really get into the principles to prove that this man lived it out. He lived it out and he succeeded. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13. You've got your Bible open. I believe it's going to be up on the screen as well. The Bible said that the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Now, that's 25 tons. Think about that. 25 tons of gold. Of gold. Every Now, that's just not a one time. That's every single year. Every single year. In one year. Besides that, not every year, but in one year, that's how much he got. Besides that, which... The explorers and the merchants brought, and all the kings of Arabia, the governors of the land, they brought gold and silver to Solomon. He made 200 large shields of beaten gold, 600 shekels of beaten gold went into each shield. This is solid gold shields. He made 300 shields of beaten gold, 300 shekels of gold went into each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it. His throne was pure gold. Now, history says six steps led up, and there was a footstool attached. The footstool also had gold. This man literally walked on gold. This is how rich that he was. Twelve figures of lions were on each step. No throne had ever existed like this in any other kingdom. All of his drinking vessels were of gold. Can you imagine having morning coffee in a golden coffee cup? The, the house of the forest of Lebanon, silver was not considered anything in the days of Solomon. For the king's ship, they went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every three years, these ships would come and bring gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. King Solomon excelled in all, excelled all of the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And all the kings of the earth, they sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought a present. Articles of silver, gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, mules, so much uh, year by year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen who he stationed in the chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. And he ruled over all the kings of the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. And he made silver as common in Jerusalem. Now, now look at this. He made silver in co as common in Jerusalem as stone. So just like a stone, that's how common silver was. And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore. So if you were to take all of that and translate that into modern-day wealth, literally Solomon's wealth is worth 
$1.1 trillion. How many know that's a lot of money? Now, according, and I looked this up to wealthresult.com, Solomon is the number one wealthiest person in the history of the world. And they ranked modern day men in that, in that list as well. But he came out on top. Came out on top of John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, uh, all of the other wealthy men that have ever lived. Solomon comes out on top. Isn't it great to have somebody in the Bible as the wealthiest man in the history of the world? Don't tell me God doesn't do things right. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so I tell you those things because what we're going to talk about tonight has been proven by this man, and I believe Solomon is going to teach us some things through the Word of God tonight, and I hope that you are ready to learn because how many would like your financial picture to go to the next level? Amen? It can. Now, before we really get into this, we've got to get out of our head first that money is wrong. Because there's a lot of people that have a misconception that money is wrong, that it's wrong to have money, that it's wrong to be wealthy, that if you are wealthy, you must have done something wrong, that you're not right with God, that you have compromised, that you are liberal, that you have cheated, or that you have whatever. You know, we've got to get that out of our head because I believe God wants to bless his people. Can somebody shout amen to that? As your heavenly father, he wants you to be blessed. Now, you may not have a throne of gold, but I still believe God wants you to be blessed. But more people struggle in the area of money and finances, and the reason is really not the lack of finances, but rather it is the wrong mindset about money. That is what causes us to struggle because we have the wrong mindset. Before you become impoverished in your money, you are first impoverished in your mind. And until you get a different mindset, you will never get a different bank account. Okay? Now, you know me on Wednesday nights. I try to be very, very practical with you. If you think it's wrong to have money, you will never have enough money. Let's just get that out of the way, okay? Because there are roughly 2,350 verses in the Bible about money. In fact, even in the teaching of Jesus, nearly 15% of everything Jesus spoke about in some way related, was related to money and possessions. There's almost twice as many verses about money as there are about faith and prayer combined. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus dealt with what was on the topic of money. In fact, the only thing he taught more of was the kingdom of God. So we've got to get out of this mindset that the moment that we accept Jesus, that we sign up for an impoverished lifestyle, that we take this vow of poverty, that is not the case. When you sign up to follow Jesus, I believe he gives you the way, amen, to make all of your financial needs met according to his riches and glory, amen. So we got to get that out of our head. And I only say that because I've met so many people that they just, you know, they say, hey, pastor, you know what the Bible says, money is the root of all evil. That is not the case. You know that. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money is a completely neutral object. Money does not do bad things to people, okay? People do bad things with money. That's the problem. So if we have the right mindset and the right heart, then we will understand what it takes to gain wealth. So I'm going to tell you from the beginning, I can't do all of this in one night. There is so much in the book of Proverbs about wealth and about money that I can't pack it all in tonight. So it's going to be at least a two-parter. So you got to come back next Wednesday, all right? Because there's a lot that I really want to say. So let's dive in tonight. I hope you're taking notes. Let's dive in. Let's see what the wealthiest man in the history of the world had to say about money. Now, first of all, let's go to Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 4. First thing that Solomon says here, Proverbs 10, verse number four, the Bible said, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Number one, you need to fall in love with work again. Now, if you thought I was going to come and tell you to simply trust God and suddenly $50 bills are going to come flying out of the heavens... You came to the wrong place. 
This is not some new age class where all you've got to do is focus on money and meditate on money and suddenly you're going to get checks from unexpected people and unexpected places simply because you thought about it and you attracted all that money to you. That doesn't happen. The Bible is very clear. Solomon is very clear um, where money comes from and it comes to those who are willing to work for it. Now, I understand this is probably not a real popular uh, concept, but he's really clear in this verse as you look at it that a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, you don't have to answer this, but I believe everybody in this house would like to be at least richer than what you are. Well, there is the secret. He said the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, when you look at that word diligent, the primary meaning of the word is sharp pointed. Sharp. The secondary Hebrew meaning is a strict decision. So when you put this in context, you need to make a strict, sharp decision to not be lazy or slack, but to work hard. And when you put forth the work, how many believe God will bless your effort and your money will begin to come when you prove yourself faithful? Do you believe it? Shout amen. Now, if you hate work, you might as well say that you hate money because you're not going to have one without the other. You're not going to have one without the other. And if you're not willing to show up on the job, this is probably, you're going to think this is the least spiritual lesson that I have ever taught you. But how many know that I'm teaching you the truth? And I understand there are situations, you know, physically where we are unable to work. I'm not, I understand that. But if you and I are physically and mentally able, amen, to put forth an effort on the job, how many believe God expects us to work hard? to show up every day and put 100% of your effort into the job that God has for you. That's how you're going to receive the wealth that God intends for you to have. You're never going to get rich binging Netflix and playing Mario Kart all day long. This is not going to happen. Now, that's why the Bible says, again, Proverbs 12, turn over there. He said, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. So if I choose to stay home all day when I have the ability to work, but I choose not to work, and I follow worthless pursuits like binging Netflix all day long when I could be working, the Bible said, I didn't say it, the Bible said, you, I, we lack sense. Because God created us to work. How many believe that? He created us to work. He even in the garden, even before the fall, he gave man jobs to do. He created us with the propensity to work. And I'm just going to say this. We are the blood-bought church of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit living within us. And we are to rule and reign in the realm of the Spirit. So if anybody ought to show up and be the absolute best employee on the job, how many believe it ought to be the child of God? Come on, somebody. Shout amen. It ought to be you showing up early, staying late, doing the extra tasks that make the job, amen, successful. Now, when you look at this, look at the verse 11 here. Whoever works his land is going to have plenty of bread. Now, I believe that Solomon here, the principle is, he is teaching you to work your own land. What I take out of this is that there is a specific place for you in the job market. And, and I, and I know that's not possible for everyone, but there is an entrepreneurial spirit that God has given to each of us in a certain way that He has, He has wired you, He has geared you, He has gifted you in a certain way that is going to match a certain job. And I'm telling you this tonight, and I feel like I'm supposed to say this. You need, I need to follow my natural God-given desires and gifting when I am looking for a job and don't take just whatever job comes my way. I believe God has created you with a specific assignment in the job market. How many believe that? 
There are skills that you have that nobody else has. And I believe so many are locked into doing a job that they hate, punching a time clock. They hate getting out of bed in the morning. They hate going to the job. They slough off and watch YouTube all day long on the job because they are not in a place that matches their God-given gifts and their God-given desires. But I believe when you find that place that you fit and you stay in that lane, you will succeed beyond everybody else. Why? Because you are living according to your God-given gifts. Amen? Does that make sense to everybody? Because we live, we live in a day where, you know, people are just simply doing whatever comes their way. Now, let me say this as well. And I felt this as I was praying this afternoon for you and for this service. I really believe God wants some of you even to start your own business. I don't know who that might be for, but there's been something in your heart for a very long time that God has given to you. And I will say this, if you will follow that calling that God has given to you to start your own business, I believe the Lord is going to provide for you and every, every door of favor that could possibly be opened. If you walk in faith and obedience, God will open that door of favor and he will bless your business when you do it for his glory. Amen. In fact, I will say I believe we need more Christian spirit-filled business owners in the job market today. We do. We need more people, more men, more women that are spirit-filled, that are employing people, giving jobs to people, and making the economy run. Because the economy, oh my God, help me now. The economy is not going to run by the government printing more money. Don't believe that lie. Well, we'll just print more money. We'll just give more rebates. We'll just do this. We'll just get, no, no, no. That's not how the economy runs. That's how you destroy the economy. That's how you put a country in recession. And I know this is church, but I'm giving you spiritual principles here. The economy runs when men and women, amen, get into the workforce, work hard, employ others, and do good ethical business with integrity that brings glory to God. Amen? Glory to God. That is true. And I believe we're missing that in this generation. This generation doesn't know, uh, they don't know what that is like because they've been handed everything. And I'm just going to tell you this, God has promised to meet your need, but he's not going to hand it to you without your willingness to use your gifts that he gave to you to do a good job in the workforce. Are you with me tonight? Amen. That's probably not what you came to hear tonight. But I'm going to say this, don't chase the money. Whatever you chase will elude you. Don't chase the money. Follow your desire and the money will follow you. And when you follow your gifting, how many believe you are gifted tonight? When you follow your gifting, the money will follow your gifting. And here's why. Because the Bible also in the book of Proverbs said, a man's gift will make room for him. And so when you follow your gifting, God will make sure that you have a place to fulfill that gifting. And when you fulfill that gifting, you then will have the economy or the money that is paid to you for the fulfillment of your gifting. Some people, they are made to be carpenters. They are craftsmen. Some are musicians. Some are CEOs. Some Whatever it is, follow your gifting. And when you follow your gifting, God will make sure you have a place to fulfill it. Do you receive that shout? Amen. Amen. Does that help anybody tonight? So, now, one, one reason we have Discover You is to help you discover that gift. And the next session begins on June the 4th. I want every, I would love everybody in this church to go through Discover You because we give you a personality profile. We give you a spiritual gift testing so you understand. And it doesn't just fit in the ministry. We tell you where it fits even in the career path that you choose. Because listen, you're created for something, right? Amen. You're created for something. Now, look at this, Proverbs 21 and verse 5. The plans of the diligent will lead surely to abundance, but everybody who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now, everybody who is hasty, everybody shout the word hasty. Everybody that is hasty will end up in poverty. So you need to hear me on this. Why don't you flip the lights up, brother? I want to make sure I can see everybody. (laughs) I want you to hear me on this. Do not follow get-rich-quick schemes. 
there have been more people sucked in to if you invest $500, I can guarantee a $5,000 a month return to you immediately. That's a lie. And especially, especially in this, this, this pandemic stricken generation where we've still got people that are, that are, that are uh, responding and reacting to a, a year of COVID-19, they have tried to find the easy way to make money. In fact, I read a statistic According to the FTC, Americans have lost $610 million to income illusions since 2016. 150 million of that came in the first nine months of 2020. Because people were at home, so all they could do is search online and find out the quickest way. Phony job listings, bad online business courses, mystery shopper scans, the lottery... If I just keep playing the lottery, I'm going to come out big. Multi-level marketing schemes. He said, everybody, let me tell you something. Amen. I really believe the best way is to put your head down, find a job where you fit, where your gifts are used, put your head down, show up every day, be the absolute best worker that you can possibly be, pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your job, pray that God anoints your hands, your mind, whatever it is that you use in your job, that's the best way you're going to make money. And if you're in it for the long haul, you're going to win. Come on, somebody shout amen. I said, you're going to win. You will. God will provide now, Proverbs 12 and 27, Solomon said, whoever is slothful is not going to roast his game, but the diligent man is going to get precious wealth. Now, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to get to the encouraging part, okay? So please don't fall out with me here. But look at this. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game. In other words, if you're lazy, you're not going to eat. It's just the way it is. Now, the New Testament equivalent of that is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, because Paul said, he said, we give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. You see, when, when we don't work, we got to find something to do, right? And so when we don't work, then we find ourselves being busybodies and doing things that are wrong and being out tattling and gossiping and doing stupid things. I'm going to tell you something. You want to lower the crime rate? First of all, get Jesus in the midst of the city and get everybody out of the house and on a job where they're working hard and they come home at night. They're so tired. They don't have time to go out and do stupid things. They're going to go to bed and sleep because they worked hard all day. Come on, somebody shout amen to that. That's good preaching right there. But the problem is nobody's doing anything, so they're not tired, and so they use their energy to go out and do stupid things and, and, and on the streets and crime and all. Let me tell you, it's time to get back to work, amen? It just is. God, help me now. I don't I, I, 2020 did so many detrimental things to the, to the American people. It took people out of church, and it took people away from the job. And it's amazing how hard it is to get people back to church and to get people back to work. There's people that are literally, there's companies literally begging to get people to work and they can't find anybody to work. When you see a fast food restaurant giving a thousand dollar incentive just to get somebody to come flip hamburgers, uh, how many of something's wrong with our culture? I said something's wrong with our culture. And so we've, we've got to get this work mentality because in all labor, Proverbs 14 and 23, in all labor, there is profit, but the talk of lips tendeth only to penury. The sluggard, Proverbs 20 and verse 4, is not going to plow by reason of the cold. So therefore, he will beg in harvest, and he's not going to have anything. In other words, what Solomon is saying, if all you do is talk about it, you're going to end up in poverty. And if you make excuses like this guy say, well, it's too cold outside, so I'm not going to plow, then you're going to end up begging simply because you let excuses stand in the way of you getting on the job. Here's my point. Let's stop talking about our dreams, and how about we start chasing in our dreams and start living what God wants us to live and go after it by the grace of God. Somebody shout amen. Amen. So that's the first way to get wealth. Fall in love with, find something you love to do so much you do it for the rest of your life and you do it for free, but you do it so well that people pay you to do it. That's what it is. That's what success is. 
when you succeed and you live in that moment, and, I'm just, and, and I may not even get done tonight, but church, let me tell you something. I really believe we ought, to, we ought to be able to get up in the morning and go to a job that we love and put everything. We're, we're the people of God. And Jesus said, I came that you might have not just life, but life more abundantly. How many believe that? Shout amen. Man, I don't want us dragging through life. I don't want us with our lip uh, hanging on the ground collecting dust. Let's put our heads up. We're the children of the Most High God. Let's put a smile on our face, show up on the job, and say, come on, fellas, let's get to it, and let's have a good day. Amen? Man, you, might, you, you can change your workplace. Uh, amen? Everybody comes dragging in around the water cooler in the coffee pot talking about how bad life is. Why don't you come in shouting glory to God? God gave you the strength and the mind and the energy and the body to work uh, and say, man, I am glad to be here, fellas. Uh, you can change that entire workplace. And guess who is going to get the promotion? It's going to be you. It's going to be you. You have that ability. Now, I believe that every one of you, every one of you can be a leader on your job. You say, but pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm not the CEO. I don't have a corner office. I don't have, you don't need a title. You don't need a position. All you need is the right heart, the right attitude, and the right influence. And when you have a positive mindset and attitude and you work hard, guess what? You are influencing and leading that organization. Amen. That's a whole other subject. I can't go there. You understand what I'm saying tonight, though? How many are ready to work hard? Come on. <laughs> Show up, man. Show up. Show up. Number two, Proverbs 11. Go there. I'm just giving you the word tonight. That's all I'm giving you. Proverbs 11, verse 24. One, Solomon said, gives freely, and he grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and he only suffers want. So whoever brings blessing is going to be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. So number two, give generously. Fall in love with work again. And number two, just give generously. Look at the wording of this verse. You give freely, and you're going to grow richer. That should be on a t-shirt. Give freely, grow richer. Just, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, give freely and grow richer. But if you withhold giving, then you're the one that's going to be in want. Simple as that. Whoever, Proverbs 19 says, is generous to the poor, lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Now, let's just be honest. Giving is totally counterintuitive to the natural mind. How many know that? Doesn't make sense. Why would I give something? Because now, if I give it away, I've lost it. No. When you give, you also receive. How many believe that? It is a biblical principle that cannot be broken. The more that I give, the more that I am going to receive in life. But the more that I withhold, the less that I receive and what I have is going to minimize in value. That is a law. It's just the way that it is. The Lord told us, you know it well, Luke 6, verse 38, he said, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will men give to your bosom because with the same measure that you give, it's gonna be measured to you again. Proverbs 3, verse 9 tells us, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all of thine increase. If you do that, look at what the Bible said. So will your barns be filled with plenty I want somebody to claim that promise right now and shout amen. amen. Your presses are going to burst out with new wine. Now, obviously, I don't want to be overly simplistic here. The first one you give to is God. How many believe that? Shout amen. It is God. You give from the first fruits of your increase, according to this scripture here. Now, of course, that brings up the biblical principle of tithing. We believe the Bible teaches that we are to give 10% of our gross income to God, to the church, to the storehouse, so the ministry can go out and the word of God can reach the congregation, the, not just the congregation, but the community. Tithe is a biblical principle. Amen. Now, 
I preached a whole message simply on tithing on Sunday, February the 12th. I'm not going to re-preach it, okay? But I want you to go back and I want you to watch it. I want you to listen to it. Even if you were here, watch it again because I gave to you what the Bible says about tithing. And if you don't have our app, bring up our slide. If you download our app, uh, I want you to get that. All of our messages, all of our events are on the app. And, and if you have that uh, through Google or through iPhone, uh, you're, you're going to be able to, to get everything you need. Watch that message again. But here's a guarantee that I make you. If you, and, and, I, and I make this guarantee based on the Word of God, if you and I will obey God in tithe, how many believe He literally will open the storehouse, uh, the windows of heaven, and you will have more than what you could ever receive from him. How many believe that? Shout amen. It's true. It is true. It is the word of God. You say, pastor, I can't afford to tithe. Listen, honey, you can't afford not to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. And the reason you can't afford to tithe is because you're not tithing. But when you start tithing, you're going to say, you know what? I do have more than enough. Because suddenly you're going to see God do things, amen, that you've never seen him do. Do you believe that tonight? It works. I don't know how it works. It's supernatural. It is a supernatural promise of God. It works. But the flip side of that is if I don't tithe, Malachi said, verse number eight of chapter three, he said, will a man rob God? Well, you've robbed me. He said, oh, how have we robbed you? He said, in tithe and in offering. And he said, as a consequence, you are cursed with a curse because you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So I can guarantee you will never financially succeed as a child of God without walking in the principle of giving the first 10%. Now, again, I'm saying that because it is the word. And I also say it because it works. It's worked in my life. Anybody in the room have seen it work in your life? Let me just hear you shout amen. It just works because it's the word of God. Now, let me go back to this principle, though, of first fruits. Look back in Proverbs 3. He said, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all of your increase. He said, then your barns are going to be filled with plenty and your presses are going to burst out with new wine. Now, first fruits is different than tithing. It is a biblical concept. Now, of, of course, we knew they lived in an agricultural society at that time. So harvest time was very significant because that was the time the farmer was rewarded for all of the hard work of planting and sowing and, 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 and tilling the ground. And so during harvest, they were, they were literally reaping what they sowed and they would bring to God the first fruit of their harvest, the best of their crop. They would bring it before they fed their family, before they went to market, they would bring it and they would give it to God as a first fruit offering. Now, the Hebrew word for first fruit is bikurim, which literally is translated promise to come. So as they would bring the crop, the first, the best of the crop, they were doing it as an investment, believing that God would give them a promise for the crops that were to come, that they would succeed even higher and better. So the difference now, tithe is given throughout the entire year. Tithe is on every paycheck. I mean, if your kids are mowing lawns for 10 bucks a lawn, you better believe a dollar of that should come and they should tithe, even if they're 10 years old. Y'all got quiet on me. How many believe your kids ought to tithe? I don't care if they're babysitting and getting 15 bucks to watch those little... Five-year-olds, bring a buck fifty and pay tithe. You're teaching them. So that's given on every pay. The first fruit, though, is when you get a harvest. Now, I know we're not, or maybe you are a farmer, but most of us are not farmers. So a harvest means, uh, amen, you are unexpectedly rewarded for a work, the work that you did above and beyond your paycheck. You know, possibly you might have got a bonus, or maybe you received a huge refund on your taxes, or maybe you save 15% or more on your car insurance. <laughs> Whatever it is. But you take that and you, you ask the Lord, God, I want to give you the best. I want to give, because of what I have received now, I want to come back to you and give you a first fruit offering. 
And so whenever you are blessed in that way, you're doing it as an investment. And you're saying, Lord, I'm bringing this to you because I believe you are promising that as I give this, uh, you're going to now take my blessing to the next uh, level. And I'm going to be able to see even more come as a result of my obedience and my faithfulness unto you. Do you believe what I'm saying tonight? Amen. I'm talking about how to get wealth. This is a principle. It is a principle. Those harvest times. Now, Genesis 4, take a look at this, and I know I've got to hurry. Genesis 4, verse 3. In process of time it came to pass, came brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. But now notice the difference. Abel, he also brought, but notice the difference, of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering, but to Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Notice the difference. Now, of course, we know, and I've always believed this as well, Cain brought not a blood sacrifice like God required. He brought of the fruit of the ground. But another difference is that Abel took the best of his livestock and brought the firstling. Whereas Cain probably just brought some fruits and vegetables after his family had eaten and just said, here you go, Lord, here it is. And God was not pleased because it was not the first of the crop. Oh, how many believe God deserves our best? Come on, somebody shout amen. He deserves our best. And so when we are blessed, we want to give to the Lord, not grudgingly. Don't say no, no, no. Cheerfully, because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. When you come and you celebrate, listen, giving and offering is a time of celebration. Do you believe that? Shout amen. That's why everybody, uh, Sunday mornings, it's a time to celebrate when we come down and we clap our hands, uh, we lift our hands and we sing. Uh, amen. We don't just drag our feet as we come. No, we come. Uh, Amen. And we give joyfully as unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So give generously. Now, not just giving to God, but giving to others. Whatever you lack in life, hear me on this, give it away. You're lacking money, give money away. You're lacking love, give love away. You're lacking friends? I don't have any friends. Nobody likes me. Why does everybody hate me? The Bible said, he that hath friends must show himself friendly. Maybe you don't have any friends because you're not friendly to anybody. You wear a scowl on your face and let the world know that you've been raised on pickle juice. You're not going to have anybody show up. But I believe if you will go above and beyond and give away that which you lack. Let me tell you something. Will you give me a few more minutes here? The reason, the reason, the reason we are lacking is because we are hoarding everything to ourselves, waiting on everybody to come to us. How about you step out of yourself and do maybe what is uncomfortable and go do something that you have never done and just see what God will bring into your life. Amen? Glory to God. It may just, well, I'm not even going to give. You just give. Everybody shout the word give. It's more blessed to give than receive is what the Bible said. Amen. Given a cup of cold water. Amen. In Jesus' name. When Jesus said, when you've done it unto the least of these, uh, you've done it unto me. Give a cup of coffee to a homeless person. Buy a meal for somebody that can't do it for themselves. Go above and beyond and just see what God will do for you. Amen. So number two, give generously. Number three. This may be a three-parter. Who knows? Do not let debt dumb you down. Now, I'm not Dave Ramsey. <laughs> but the Bible said this, Proverbs 22 and 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, 
According to Dave Ramsey, the total personal debt in the United States is at an all-time high of $14.96 trillion. That's how much people are in debt in our country. And I know this is a tough subject to talk about. The average American debt per adult is $58,604. And 77% of American households have at least some type of debt. Now, obviously, debt is simply owing any money to anybody for any reason. And I understand there are times in which you have to take out a loan. I'm not saying that you don't ever take out a loan. But what I am saying, more people are lacking money because they have buried themselves in debt over dumb choices and decisions, buying things on credit that they never needed and they never wanted in the first place. And now they've got credit card bills that are snowing them under and they wonder why they can't make it financially. Credit card debt, eight of 10 Americans have at least one credit card. 45% of American households carry a balance, which simply means they don't pay their credit card down to zero every month. 55 million households have credit card debt, and the average credit card debt is per person is, or per household is $14,241. And the total in America in credit card debt alone has hit $787 billion with a B. Now, the average interest rate on, have you looked at the interest rate on your credit card? 17.13%. So if you, let's do the math here, okay? Get your, get your calculators out. If you multiply 17.13% by the $787 billion that Americans owe, that's about $134.81 billion that credit card companies are pulling in on interest alone. That's not even the payments. That's just the interest. Do you understand why we're struggling financially? Car loans, car loan, uh, auto loan debt in America is $1.4 trillion. 37% of us, and I've had car loans. That's about 45.4 million households. Average car loan is $31,142, which means the average person is paying $577 a month for new vehicles and a $413 car payment for a used car. And I understand that's part of it, but not always. There are other kinds of debt, student loans, home equity lines of credit, mortgages, and, 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 and I know you probably came thinking, man, Pastor, I thought you were going to tell me how to make money. <laughs> I'm giving you the Bible here. Your greatest, Solomon said, the servant or the, the, the borrower is servant to the lender. There are more people in spiritual bondage tonight because they are in financial debt than what we would like to admit. And here's the deal. Hear me on this. Your income is the greatest tool you have to build wealth. Your income. But when you are snowed under with multiple credit cards and multiple uh, debts on credit cards, uh, we, <laughs> What happens is you can't build wealth because you're spending this month's income on last month's expenses or last year's or last decades. You're still paying on stuff that you bought five years ago. And whereas if you would free yourself up from that debt, now your income can be invested in the future and you can be building a future and building a business and a home and a family for your children. Why? Because you have removed yourself out from under the burden of debt. Are you understand what I'm saying tonight? And I'm not being critical. Please, I'm not trying to make, uh, bring any kind of condemnation. But, but, but I, I really believe if we will be wise, uh, God can help us pay off, at least pay down if not pay off our debt. Do you believe that? Let me give you some practical things here real quick. Number one, face the fact of your debt. That's the hardest thing that we have to do because we like to think if we ignore it, it's going to go away. Shove it under the bed. Nobody's going to see it, right? But the best thing you and I need to do is write everything down that we owe on a piece of paper. And here's why. Because what is visible is manageable. If I don't see it, then I can't create a plan on how to manage it. So write it all down. 
You, you, I, know you, I know that causes stress. You're saying, Pastor, I don't, want to, I don't want to see what all I owe. I know that causes stress and anxiety, but here's the deal. You will never conquer anything you don't confront. And if you keep paying the minimum, y'all aren't going to get mad at me, are you? You keep paying the minimum payment on that credit card, you are never going to get out of debt. Because that minimum payment doesn't even hardly go towards anything on your balance. It's almost all interest. So, number one, put it down. Number two, and, and this, is, this is from Dave Ramsey. He said, create an emergency fund. Before you start paying off your debt, get a fund where you put $1,000 into a bank account. Build that up. And here's why. Because how many know life happens? Flat tires happen right? Refrigerators leak, uh, leak and accidents happen. You got to go to the doctor. And if you don't have a fund to pay that, what are you going to pay it with? Your credit card. But if you have a fund to pay it, you're not going to dip back into that credit card and put yourself more into debt. Now, number three, start with the smallest and work your way up. And again, I don't know how this works. I don't know how the math works. But if you will pay off all non-mortgage debt from smallest to largest, you're going to create momentum. This is the key. It's momentum, okay? It is motivation to keep going. This is what Solomon said. Look in Proverbs 13 and verse 11. I'm really trying to help you tonight. Is this helping anybody tonight? I really am trying to help you. He said, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. Whoever gather, gathers little by little. Everybody say just a little bit. Little by little will increase it. In other words, if you just little by little begin to sock money on that, uh, on that debt, you are going to gain momentum and keep going then. Uh, put all the money, th throw it all on that smallest debt. When that is done, go after the next smallest and keep going at it, keep going at it, keep going at it, and believe that you can come to the place, uh, amen, of being financially free so you can actually do with your money what God wants you to do it and don't give it to Chase Bank. You can give it to God. Amen? Amen. Now, I got to give you one more thing, and then I'm going to get out of your way. I promise. What if somebody wants to borrow money from you? Whew. Pastor, you shouldn't go here. I didn't. Solomon did, so blame him, okay? Proverbs 22 and verse 26, check this out. He said, don't be one of them that strike hands or one of them that are sureties for debts. Now, striking hands in the Bible is the same as shaking hands in our world. So basically, it's used to seal a deal. What Solomon is teaching is that a simple commitment that you make to cover somebody's debt without really thinking it through can create a liability that can wipe you out financially. It will do it. And he was warning, King Solomon was, against foolish financial risk because he knew, especially for kings that had a lot of money, there was a temptation for wealthy people to guarantee other people's debt. And the desire to help those in need could be actually hazardous to the wealth of that individual. Now, here's the, th here's the tricky thing, because we are commanded to give to those in need. I understand that. We are commanded to do that. But is there a difference between lending to someone in need and giving to someone in need? Maybe you should think of it this way. Before you lend money to a friend and expect them to pay you back, you should decide which you need the most, the friend or the money, because you're probably not going to get both. It just won't happen. Now, let me give you this scenario. It's even worse. <laughs> Sometimes it's even worse lending money to family. You know, let's say your nephew comes up and says, hey, uncle, I need 500 bucks because, man, I've always wanted to open my own bakery. I need $500 to start my bakery. Would you just help a brother out? I'll pay you back. Just be so grateful. Now, you can do one of three things. You can, you can give him the money. You can loan him the money. But here's the deal. Every time you see your nephew, that debt is going to be between you. Because remember, the Bible said, the borrower 
is servant to the lender. You now rule him. Now, you don't say that, but you feel it. And Thanksgiving dinner can get kind of awkward. Am I right? So you can give it to him, but there's going to be a change in the relationship. It will change. I guarantee it will change. Or you can just simply say no. You can politely decline. Or thirdly, if you are blessed, you can just give him the money. Give it to him and say, here's $500 to go start your business. God bless you. I pray God's best over you. And I pray over this investment that I'm making in you and your business. And there is nothing that you owe me. How many believe God would bless that? And who knows, you might get free cupcakes for a year. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, you've got to be very careful on this thing of debt. And I really believe we are commanded, and I'm closing. I've said that about four times now. (laughs) I really am. There is so much to talk about with this. And I really want to help. And come on, team. I really want to help you. Because listen, how many believe God wants us to be wise stewards? Let me hear you shout amen. And, and, And there is so much in the body of Christ that is just frivolity is just happening. And, and I really believe God wants to bless you financially. He does. And the principles, and I'm, and I'm going to give you some more next week, okay? So, so I do want you to come back all, all out of the book of Proverbs. But I really do believe God wants to bless you financially. But it's going to take a commitment on your part to do what God's called you to do. And tonight, I want you to stand, if you will, in, in, in the presence of the Lord right now. And I just want to pray over you. And I really believe as I prayed for you this afternoon, I believe God is inspiring some of you to get out and do some things you've never done before. Whether that's a new business, whether that's a new job, whether that's a new stream of income, I don't know what it is. But I'm going to pray that God just opens up, opens up your heart to see exactly what he's calling you to do. Because everybody in this room, everybody in this room can be financially blessed. Do you believe that? Amen. I want to pray over you. So I'm going to ask you real quickly as you go ahead and and, and begin to play. I want you to come down to the front, if you will, with me right now. Come on. Amen, just come on. And I know I've gone long. I apologize for that. But I, I want to I pray over you. And I want you to come on. Come on, just as close as you possibly can. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, come on. Just everybody that can, physically come. I don't know where you are financially. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're doing well. I don't know. I don't know where you are on your job. But the Holy Spirit is in this room. And God does not want you to struggle financially. It is not his will. I I can tell you that based on the word of God. It is, David said, I have never, ever seen the righteous forsaken. And I've never seen his seed begging bread. Never. That is the word. And so tonight, maybe you are struggling financially. And I did not come in any way to bring condemnation on you. But I did tell you this. If you will follow the biblical principles, how many know God's going to show up? And he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of every single one of the needs that you have right now. He will take care of if you will follow these principles. So I want you right now to lift up your hands. Amen. Just all across the room. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift up your hands. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, I feel faith in this room. Lord, I feel faith in this room. And Lord, your word, God, it's already given to us. Lord, it's just already given to us, Lord, that you will supply all of our need according to your riches and glory. And Lord, right now, I rebuke this, 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 this spirit of poverty and this impoverished mindset. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I take authority over and command the devil's lie to be broken in the name of Jesus right now. Lord, we will not be without. We will not go without our needs being met. Father, we are your children. And Lord, you said, if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. And if we knock, it will be open. Because if anybody asks, because as a father, if if my son asks for bread, Lord, I'm not going to give him a stone. You're my heavenly father. You're going to give us what we need. Come on, somebody receive that promise right now. In the name of Jesus, get rid of that impoverished mindset. Get rid of that demonic lie that you will not have enough. You have enough in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody receive a shout. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, right now, Lord, 
I'm asking for an, uh, a, 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 a spirit of, of inspiration, of creativity, of entrepreneurship to rise up in somebody right now. Holy Spirit, rise up. Come on, let it rise up. Let it rise up. There have been shackles. There have been doors. There have been locks. There have been chains on the dream that God has planted within you. And I rebuke that chain. I rebuke that shackle in the name of Jesus. And I release the God-given anointing to rise and walk in your dream and be fulfilled in what you are created to do in the name of Jesus hallelujah somebody receive it unlock it unlock it unlock it unlock it Lord unlock the shackles pull back the doors pull back the doors glory to God for me to walk in that which I am created to do in Jesus name and father we commit to you tonight Lord, that we are giving that which is rightfully yours. Lord, tonight I commit to you my tithe. I commit to you, Lord, 10% of my income as your word has taught me to do. And Lord, now because of that, I believe the windows of heaven, amen, will fling wide open in my life. And the rights, God, that you have given to me as a tither, amen, I claim in the name of Jesus and I walk in everything that you have promised. And Lord, I give you praise because you are a faithful God, amen. Oh, hallelujah. And Lord Jesus, we just believe you're here tonight. We believe you're here tonight. Oh Lord, and I give you the praise because of who you are. You are so faithful. So faithful. Can we just sing that part of the chorus? It's your breath in our lungs. And just, just that part of that chorus. And I just want you to take a moment to use the breath, that God-given breath. Amen. To issue up a praise. That from this moment on, and I believe I can say this with all certainty, from this moment on, you will never again financially lack, but you will walk in the greatest days of financial prosperity according to the Word of God that you have ever had. And I want you to receive that from the Spirit of the Lord because the door, amen, to God-given wealth has been opened to you tonight in the name of Jesus with the windows of heaven that are being being poured out upon those that are walking in truth and in integrity. Receive it now. And if you do, shout amen.